Hey everybody, welcome to the final Sacred Cow Barbecue in Studio B. I did that perfect. Next week, we're moving over to Studio A on Thursdays. Folks back east will have to stay up with the big kids since we'll be on from 10 p.m. to midnight. Here in the west, I think it's actually a little more convenient time for a lot of folks. So good thing uh, your host, Sleeping Beauty, is in the Pacific time zone. I could never do a show from at 10 o'clock. It's Thursday, September 22nd, and I'm Patricia Aiken, your average host with exceptional guests. I've been looking forward to hearing Angelo John Gage's story since I met him about a month ago. He's a veteran with two tours in Iraq under his belt. He told me he was slow to wake up to the realities of race. I'm sure being an expectant dad adds to his motivation to confront the white genocide that's happening in every white nation. He leads the National Youth Front, which is what you can see at the .com by the same name, nationalyouthfront.com. So, Angelo, glad you can make it to the barbecue today. Welcome. Well, I'm glad to be here. It's an honor. Well, it's awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm glad we weren't on yesterday. We stepped down for a good part of the day, hawking the volunteers with juggling chainsaws to keep the station on the air. So we got smooth sailing here today, though. Yeah, Skype sometimes drops calls in the middle of things, and it sucks at times. But it's free, so yeah. that's what you get for free. Yeah. Uh, communication. <laughs> uh, but also, I want to say that you could also go to nationalyouthfront.com, or you can do uh, www.nyf.us, which is shorter for those lazy people, yeah. <laughs> which I use now too. It goes to the same site, and as we had to transfer our original um, host to another one and all that stuff. So that was a long story short. We had to do some stuff in the back end. So now we have both domains. Uh, so either one, nationalyouthfront.com or www.nyf.us, same thing. You'll get to the same place. And that's pretty much what I wanted to add there. Okay, cool. So, you know, yeah. I, I got to tell you, I'm a, little, I'm a little suspicious when someone has three names, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah. <laughs> Someone's asking me, uh, Studio B, right? Yeah, Studio B. Yeah, Studio B. I'm yeah, tell them to come on over. I'm going to right. write that again on Twitter. Okay, go ahead. While you're doing that, I'm going to tell people, if you go over to either nyf.us or nationalyouthfront.com, take a look at the memes. Angelo has some of the coolest memes, and if you agree – with this point of view, if you hear this and it makes sense to you, and I'm hoping it will. Now, I don't want that knee-jerk reaction for people to start saying, oh, my gosh, he's such a race. No, just shut up for a little bit and listen, okay? Shut your mind down and say, I've got to listen to this. I mean, Patricia's pretty reasonable about a lot of stuff, and so just listen and see if you can see what is so obvious to Angelo and I and so many others, I mean, it's time to wake up. If this mass immigration thing isn't, isn't waking you up yet, uh, you, need to, you need to listen here. So, Angelo, you done, uh, done with Twitter? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. Hey, so, so tell me, what's your, what's your story? What, tell me about you. Who, who are your mom and dad? How were you raised? How would you get in the military? All that. Yeah, basically, uh, I was uh, born in Italy. And I lived there till I was two years old. My parents, my mother's Italian. My father is American. He was born in Kansas, but he moved to Italy when he was four because my grandfather was a major in the U.S. Air Force. He fought in the Korean War. So he was stationed in Italy for some reason. I guess there was a base there. I don't know. There he met, my, my mother met my father and the rest is history. But when I was, when my father was 19, he came back to America, land of opportunity, because back in the 80s, everything was doing great, you know. Mm -hmm. So I came when I was two. I lived in New Jersey my whole life. And I was raised uh, Roman Catholic, as most Italians are, uh, religious. Uh, my grandfather, he was a very intelligent man, spoke 12 languages. He would do, at the dinner table, he would do little prayers in Latin. So this is how deeply religious he was. Uh, and my, my mother's side, my, my grandfather on her side, was just a farmer in Italy, normal guy, great guy, you know. Both of my grandparents are dead, but my grandmothers are still alive. So that's, uh, you know, most men die first, apparently. That's how it works in nature. I have had this military bloodline since for my grandfather and then his father. My great-grandfather was a Marine as well. But my, gran my grandfather was in the Air Force, but my great-grandfather was a Marine. My father didn't serve, but I did. So I lived in New Jersey my whole life. When, High school came about when I was 17. The whole 9-11 thing took place. And like everyone else, I was like, oh, my God. And at that point, you know, I, I wasn't a bad student. I, I just was really bored with school. Nothing really interested me. 
You know, I always that's thought of that's because they don't teach you anything of value. When you get something that you like, you can't stop. You can't put it down, right? Right. They don't teach you anything, really. They don't teach you how to. You know, they don't teach you self-esteem. They don't teach you how to do your taxes. They don't teach you how to start a company. They don't teach you anything but to be a, a worker ant. So I really, I guess, uh, subconsciously, didn't really like school. I wasn't a bad student per se. I just didn't care about what they were saying. And I learned quickly. I was pretty smart, but I, I didn't really apply myself in school. And so, um, you know, that's just the way it was with me when I was younger. I was, I was a late bloomer, you know, but when the 9-11 thing happened, I felt like, you know, maybe I could prove to be a man by joining the Marine Corps. And I actually went out of my way to join the Marine Corps. At 17 years old, I joined this uh, program called the Delayed Entry Program, which you're not part of the Marine Corps yet, but you sign up earlier. So you have like this, not indoctrination, but kind of like to get to know how it works. Like it's like a, they they, they teach you like ranks. It's like, it's, it's like pre med. Yeah, it's like pre med. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's basically like a year of you know getting together with other people who want to join with you and learning the structures of ranks and then and the laws and the Marine Corps and history. So you you pretty much learn stuff for a year. You go on runs together. It's 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 pretty cool for someone who wants to join. Because so I was motivated and I called the guy. He's like, well, you can't join yet, so you got to just wait a year until you're 18, and then you can join. So I did this whole delayed entry program, which takes a year off your reserve program, so it kind of actually benefits you to do it. I joined when I was uh, – I got to – once once high school blended in 2006, four days later, I went right to boot camp. So there was no you know last summer with my friends, nothing. It was right to boot camp, Paris Island, in the worst heat possible – you know, and uh, in the sand, all over your shirt and everything. And I went through training for three months. I did the whole shebang. Uh, then I went to Marine combat training because every – I wasn't an infantryman. I was a, a, combat, a combat engineer. That was my MOS, mode of service. Because if I was an infantryman, I wanted to go to school of infantry. So they don't actually – they tell you, yeah, you can pick, but you really can't. They put you where they need you. So they needed combat engineers. That's where they put me. Uh, I wanted to go to Intel. That was already full. Point is, I went to the Marine Corps, got went to engineer school, and then right after I graduated in November, a few months later, I was in Kuwait. So right there, I was deployed February 14, 2003. This is where the war began. And then we got our march, uh, marching orders so like a month or so later to go into Iraq. And then I, I did five months there in Iraq. Totally, the place was totally destroyed. Uh, I witnessed the most powerful military in history completely annihilate cities. And there's, just, there's no chance for these people against us at all. Did five months there, came back, uh, went on leave, which means I get to go home, see my family, stuff like that. Went back to Iraq literally the same date a year later. So February 14th, again, Valentine's Day. Went back to Iraq, this time for seven months, doing humanitarian missions like defusing landmines, blowing up unexploded ordnance like, you know, IEDs, right. bu building sea huts, um, fortifying stuff, going on security convoys, things like that. So, I mean, a Marine, you get a job, you get an MOS, like you can be uh, a combat engineer, but you're still going to do security stuff, infantry stuff. It doesn't matter. Every Marine is a rifleman. That's what they say. And it's true. So no matter what your training is, at some point, you're going to be doing some sort of security detail or something like that because there's only 70,000 Marines out there. You know what I mean? We don't have millions of people on our side uh, in our in our uh, organization. So yeah, I, used to, I used to know someone that joked that, um, you, you know, you say, oh, yeah, the Marines Department of the Navy. And you say, yeah, the men's department. Right. Exactly. They are. Um, they, yeah, that's what they that's that's the joke. Yeah, and we're also the, for the president's own too. the president can deploy us as he sees fit, uh, as he sees fit. Uh, with some special order, I'm sure, but uh, we're we're called the president's own, like we're his own little, you know, people. And we go in there, we secure the area, and then the army comes in to occupy. That's how it pretty much works. So our deployments are seven months at a time, whereas the army can be a year to two years to forever. You know what I mean? Well, you know, so, you're, you're making my point. You know, I've always I've said for a lot of years now that the military plays on a young man, especially a white young man need to provide and protect his family. Yes, absolutely. And, but, and they take advantage of a lot of these minorities who have been in trouble or don't have money 
and they offer you educational benefits and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, you can either go to prison or you can go to the military. And they go, right. well, let's see, prison, military, prison, military. Uh, I'll take the military. Right, right, exactly. So, I mean, my experience in the military, there's plenty of diversity there. And I got along with everyone, all the different races there, you know, because you're all doing the same thing. All of your interests are the same. Follow orders. Okay, there's no different conflict of interest. There's a rank structure. It's top-down leadership. Okay, so it's not like it's a democracy at all. It's, a, it's literally an authoritarian structure. So your rank determines what privileges you have. So uh, it works in that aspect because you're just really diverse pawns. You really have no value. You're, just, you're, you're just a government pawn. You're a weapon. You're a machine, a uh, killing machine for some people. And uh, that's really all you do. So, you know, people ask me, well, you've served in the military and you should have that. How do you have these racial views? It doesn't really apply there because you're all literally robots and it doesn't even matter what you are. You know, a friend of mine who's who's my age, which is antique, he remembers when his dad was in the military, but he remembers when the military was segregated here in the United States. Oh, yeah. Back then, the blacks were treated worse than the Germans treated them in the I think uh, the, the Wehrmacht or the SS, if I, if, I, if I recall, in World War II had all sorts of different races in their ranks, whereas the Americans would actually segregate blacks from different ranks and have their own legions that they'd throw at in like the worst suicide missions or something like that. I'm not a historian, but these are the things I've heard. There's in America than there was in Nazi Germany in regards to these other races. Oh, yeah, and I love those photos that um, ApacheClips.com has the Wehrmacht soldiers uh, you know, that shows all the different races that served Hitler. And the interesting thing about them is, from what I read, is that Hitler could have paid them a lot less money. They were from, a lot of them were from third world countries, but instead he paid them exactly the same as he played his German nationals. Yeah, yeah, he paid, uh, from what I understand, he uh, did everyone uh, uh, as an equal as their structure, you know, at the rank structure they had. He didn't mistreat any of these people. But as you said, as you said, there was racism in America, where you know these blacks were treated like crap and gave and given these uh, horrendous missions and even experimented on with uh, certain things. Oh, absolutely. So, so it's really ridiculous uh, that most Americans don't even know this information because of the brainwashing via the media. But yeah, so my experience in the military, I, I, I even that. I pretty much was a good Marine per se, but I really wasn't because I didn't like taking orders from people. It just wasn't in my nature, but I did what I was told. My, my first tour, I um, got in trouble for something stupid and I was made an example of, and it really kind of broke my spirit. I said, I thought this was you know, brotherhood, you know, like we were supposed to be all comrades, but in the, it, just like any other organization, politics matter. And when you make a mistake and they could use you as an example, they'll burn you in front of everybody. And that's pretty much what happened to me. And, uh, you know, so I realized, you know what, this organization's all talk. It's just all for show. I don't feel like, uh, this was a nice thing to do to me. You know, it was a stupid thing I did. It was, a, I, I unknowingly disobeyed an order, which I didn't even understand. Yeah. And so basically, they punished me in front of everyone because they had an opportunity yeah. to, uh, but I didn't even know what I did wrong. You know, I was like, I was 18. I didn't understand what they were talking about. This could have been l- held at the platoon level. Like the guy who said, Ange, what are you doing there? Because I was writing a letter to my girlfriend. And what I was writing apparently was not right. I couldn't have said these things like, hey, I'm in Kuwait. We're going to do this now. They said that was a breach of operational security or something. I'm like, what do you, what does that even mean? Right. I didn't understand. So what should have happened was my fire team leader should have said, Ange, Rip that up. What are you doing? Don't mail that. Yeah. Or say, right. hey, Jack, yeah. uh, hey, jackass, why don't you go fill up some sandbags as punishment? Instead, he he reported me to my superiors, and then they kept going up to the colonel. Oh, my so here, God. So here I was at the the colonel who ran the entire base telling me, you're an idiot. You shouldn't have done that. I'm like, what? Did I, I didn't even know what I did. It was so stupid. And they had to burn me. So I realized that you know they, they lost a potentially good Marine there. But uh, toward the end of my that's when I was first because I, I graduated from engineer school with the highest of honors. I was I was the guide who held the who held the flag at, at, while we marched, had high grades. Yeah. So I was going to get promoted to Lance Corporal like in a few months. So when I was in Kuwait, this happened, which is so stupid. It could have just slapped me on the wrist. But hey, dude, what are you doing? Go fill up some sandbags. They couldn't punish me at the platoon level. They made a big drama out of it. And they pretty much broke my uh, motivation yeah. for being a Marine. 
Yeah, which is great because otherwise it would have been a lifer, which they call someone who stays in for life and yeah. fought these Zio wars forever. So this happened. I had still three years left. You know, it just, just just started. I'm like, wow, this really sucks. What is this crap? This just shows me, they say shit rolls downhill. I don't know I can curse on the show, but that's what they say. <laughs> and um, once I saw this politicking, I guess, this, you know, try to impress people and punish people, I realized this wasn't for me because I'm like, where's this honorable stuff, you know? Yeah, exactly. So, what happened so, with the honor? Yeah. Right, right. Brotherhood, honor, this and that. So then I realized I, I just continued to do my duty because I said, you know, I'll still get my educational benefits. I, I'll, I'll just I'll just stick this through. And then I actually got my stuff together despite my NJP, non-judicial punishment. It took a, a month's pay for, from me, and they took away my rank, which I was supposed oh to get. Oh, my God. E- after, about writing a letter to your girlfriend, they never even explained what operational well, security was. Well, they did in a, in, a, in a brief, and I didn't understand it because I'm I'm a seven I'm 18 years old. I'm not you know really there. I'm all you know what I'm saying. Like, so they should you know regardless of what happened there, which is silly. It, the point I'm trying to make it could have been taken care of at a, at a at a platoon level. Everyone said that, and they're like, what are they doing? Just one kid wanted to suck up to his higher ups yeah. to make look what I found out. You know, her, her. yeah, you know, and, and it was. Uh, Basically, uh, you know, I, I basically said, hey, we're going to go to we're going to go from Kuwait to Iraq. This is obvious. Yeah. And we're going to build the bridges. And I, and I said things. I said, what if this what if this was intercepted? And I had stick figure drawings and, and, and it was a stupid map like, hey, this is what we're doing, which is stupid to do. But it was so dumb. How can it be taken seriously? Stick figures. You know, yeah. I was like, I was 18. I was a stupid kid. But anyway, so um, they punished me for that. And then after when I returned, you know, I, I said, you know what? This sucks, but I'm going to make the best of it. And. You know, I then got uh, I got my stuff together and uh, I, I, I was a marksman, which is like the worst shooter that you can be. There's marksman, there's a um, sharpshooter, and then there's expert rifleman. So I practiced on my shooting skills, got expert rifleman, got promoted to corporal. So I left the Marine Corps as a corporal. But before I left the Marine Corps, this is what really happened and changed my life. I was, uh, you know, just I was doing something called MIMS clerk. It's military. Uh, I forgot the acronym there's all these acronyms yeah. a mims clerk is somebody who uh takes care of inventory and i was working for the um the bridge uh battalion where we uh make irbs where these these are bridges that we can open up in the water and they float so i did always make sure that all the equipment all the millions of dollars of equipment were in check everything was good to go and um you know, I was on the computer a lot you know so i had access to the internet and i was researching the iraq war and i learned that we the good guys were using white phosphorus gas on Iraqi people. So I'm like, wait a minute, how are we using uh, this? Looks like a chemical weapon to me. I saw the corpses of these people, these victims burnt to a crisp. Like this is not a conventional weapon. This is a chemical weapon, but they say, no, it's not a chemical weapon. It's an incendiary weapon, smoke screen. You know what I mean? You, you, You deploy it and then you can't see anything. But at the same time, this burns you once it touches your flesh, it kills you. You know, so I'm like, why are we using white phosphorus gas? We're the good guys, I thought. And this was being used in the Battle of Fallujah because Fallujah was one of the Iraqi strong points with all these insurgents. And it was very difficult to defeat them there. I was really turned off by this. And that just started it. So I had a few months left, you know, sitting there. And then one day my friend's little brother sent him a video, a CD video of 9-11 loose change. The video. Oh, yeah, loose change. So that was the first thing I was like, well, what's this? And so we watched it and I go, oh my God, what the hell? So I'm like, this whole war is fake. And, and thankfully I only had three months left. Yeah. So I don't have to endure this crap. So I wanted to get out immediately. The second I got out, I drove out of Camp Lejeune, my, my middle finger up, see you later, done. I was gone. Yeah. And so I was just never again. And I told any person I ran into never join the military. You know, luckily for me, I got my benefits educationally. I went to I went to college for two years, which I also again I applied myself this time. I got straight A's. My GPA was three eight six. Got accepted at Rutgers University, who I would later troll in the future, which I'll get to. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but I did I didn't complete college because again yeah. I was in college. Angelo, Angelo, hold yeah. on for just a second. I got a couple questions here, and I'm sure if, if yeah, they're yeah. burning in my head, they got a, people sure. that are listening want to hear this too. So when you find out that 9-11 was a complete Mossad U.S. operation, c- complete hoax that they pulled on the, on the U.S. people, did you show that video to anybody else in your, in your platoon? 
No, I mean it was me and my roommate. Uh, I don't remember watching it with anyone else, but I'm probably I'm I'm sure I talked about it, but I don't think anyone took us seriously because when that first came out, everyone thought you were crazy. Oh wow, no, because I I followed it for, for early on. Yeah. And what did they feel? Yeah. How did they feel about the White Foster's about seeing what they were doing to civilians? Well, again, I didn't I didn't really talk much there because at that point I'm still under the Marine Corps and I can probably get punished if I start talking like that. So I just these are things I learned. I, I talked to maybe my close friends about, but no one really cared at that point. They didn't really believe it or the nine eleven uh, loose change didn't talk about Mossad. It talked about Bush, Cheney and all these other people. Right, so that right. wasn't even the truth yet. Mm -hmm. Um but when I learned that I had three months and I got out and that's when I started a truth seeking journey which began in college because I took philosophy and all these other courses that was all about critical thinking, communications as well, just to learn how to speak to people, how the mass media works, all this stuff uh, that I learned, how uh, it manipulates the public with TV commercials. Like there's, you know, like there's so many, uh, for example, children get like pit with thousands of candy commercials per day. You know what I mean? Like right. just because they're trying to sell candy. Can, 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 candy and, and stupid sugared up cereal. <laughs> right, right, right. And, and and violence and all this other stuff. So um, I started learning that, you know, what, what's up with this media? Because my teacher was pretty liberal. And uh, I don't mean like, well, I don't know how he is now, but he was all about, you know, telling us the truth about stuff. And my political um, politics teacher, what is that? Uh, I forgot how to say oh, the class. Oh, yeah, political science. He, he hated. He's like these criminals in D.C. You know, so he was always talking about wow. um, the crime, but he didn't know anything about Mossad or Israel. He had no idea. But he's talking about these criminals in D.C. So this all fell into place. I'm like, yeah, there are criminals there. And then when I took my philosophy course, I started questioning everything, like even religion. I was like, well, I'm a Roman Catholic, but how can these people who say they believe in God blow up their own towers? You know, so I started questioning them. And I started getting into all sorts of conspiracy people from Alex Jones to David Icke and the aliens and ghosts and goblins and every possible <laughs> truth movement you could ever imagine. I, oh, I, I'm telling I, you, I went, the, inter the Internet is a morass, isn't it? I mean, once you in, – in most people – I like what someone said. They said any one of these topics is a life study. But instead, people that – truth seekers – Oh my God! They have to have so much bandwidth. One leads to another, that leads to another, that leads to another. We know more about you know stuff than most experts on any issue. Yeah, it's it's a it's a big web. It's really a big maze out there to get to the truth. And you know, like I said, uh, I, I listened to uh, Alex Jones for a while because he made the most sense. Uh, he talked about the globalists, the government, the Illuminati, the Bilderberg. I learned into that. I I, I got into Michael Sarian, who talks about sure. aliens who came to earth and manipulated our DNA and changed everything. And I had got I even I actually spoke to Jordan Maxwell on the phone for half an hour, which uh, he used to have his phone number on his website, called him up just to talk about stuff. And that was interesting. And um, I was on a truth seeking mission. I wanted to know what was going on. Cause if religion was not real, then who ran the planet? Oh, aliens. Okay. Well, who runs them? And then I got into David Icke, which talks about shape-shifting lizards who live in another dimension. And I got into him and I read his huge book, um, I think sure. humanity get off your knees. Seven hundred pages, a ton of information. Uh, he even gets into the version of his the Holocaust, where he said that you know the Jews actually sacrificed their own people to create Israel. So it's kind of true, but that's not it. But then he talks about Rothschild Zionism, and that's where it really got me. I'm like, who's this Rothschild guy? So I looked into Rothschild <laughs> Zionism, and I found out about who he was. That he was a German Jew, and how he ran this banking cartel. And then I found out, then I typed in, well, why does everyone hate the Jews? And then, boom, that's where it all started. Um, so I, I got into World War II revisionism, uh, the truth about uh, Adolf Hitler, how he's the most slandered and libeled man in history. I learned everything from that. And that wasn't even the start of it. That just got me like, oh, well, you know, we relied about this stuff. Big deal. Yeah. But it was white genocide, which is happening now, that got that fire in my ass. That's what really got me. So it's one thing to go back and say, okay, we relied about this time in history. That's over. But then to say, you know what? That's still going on today against our people by the same perpetrators. I have to do something about it, which basically led to me make this video on YouTube that went viral and put me on the scene, per se, in this community, if you want to call it that. What's the name of the video? Uh, it's I, I keep forgetting. It's called, I put it, a call of duty. Uh, we, we whites 
must awaken otherwise i don't know some long title i don't know why i made it so long i probably changed it too but it was my first video I ever made it has like twenty six thousand views on it it you know, what's, within, your, what's, your, what's your YouTube channel for everybody? And, and Angelo John Gage. You just look it up. Okay. And uh, you, you go there and uh, you just um, – you'll see my – I mean I can, I can pull it up right now if you want just to sure. make sure. Because I know I changed the name because I remember it was so long at one point. But I, I know I, made it, I named it Call of Duty because I use a uh, personal uh, analogy in it. And I use the term firewatch, which basically means as a Marine, we go on firewatch, which uh, – Two Marines or more will be up and watching the platoon as they sleep. It's called Firewatch. So if anything right. happens, you have to you have to awaken the people who are sleeping. Right. So I use this analogy. I so, say, you know, you have to. It's like you have to be on Firewatch uh, because you have the enemy coming. You have to wake everyone up. And I tell people that's what we need to do here. So your job is to be on Firewatch and tell everyone the enemy's here. And actually, the, the so the video is called Call of Duty. Spread the word to stop white genocide. So I changed it. To, it was some other long stuff. And then that was my first video. Right now it has 29,288 views. This was made two years ago. Oh, so, cool. yeah, so it's not like 100,000 or anything crazy. But I mean, most of my view, most of my videos today get an average of 1,700, 2,000 views now that I got more popular in the movement or the cause or whatever you want to call this. That first video got me on the map everywhere. And it got me involved on a radio show called The White Voice for eight months, which I started doing that with this kid who uh, invented it. His name was Joe. And it was cool to do that, and I liked it, and that got me out there even more. But uh, then I got a hold of uh, someone contacting me from the American Freedom Party. said, hey, would you like to run for office for us? I said, hey, well, I guess. You know, why not? That didn't work out because I tried to submit the paperwork. And I messed up the uh, forms. I got I downloaded one form for one thing, but I had the physical form of another, and I got oh. signatures on both, and one was null and void. So the day of, which is my fault, again being ignorant to how things work, I submitted it thinking I was good, and they said, "Sir, half of these are null, they're voided." I'm like, uh, "It's like, well, what can I do?" She's like, "Well, you have an hour and a half to get them all back, get new ones." I'm like, Pfft. I'm an hour and a half from home. How can I get these people? So it was over for that, which probably worked out better because I wasn't prepared. A few months later, I keep making videos, and then my friend Nathan, who created the National Youth Front, reached out to me and said, Ange, you know, would you like to be our chairman? Because our other chairman just stepped down. And I said, you know what? Yeah, I'll do it. Because I figured, you know, why should I wait to go into a system of politics where it's rigged and I probably won't win, where I can do something called practical politics right now, take action right now? Well, I don't need anyone's votes. I could just get a group of people and go protest or put up flyers or make videos. And that's what I've been doing since February of, of this year. Well, Angelo, so, um, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm delighted when I see young men like you that, that are passionate about this. You people like Kyle Hunt and stuff in, in what you folks are doing, wake people up to the reality of race and what the end game really is towards us. Yeah, I actually met Kyle Hunt. In fact, when I first got into this scene, he he drove up to meet me. With uh, he was making a documentary, Radio Renegades. Uh, I forgot the title of it, but I was in there for like 15 minutes. So I met his his crew, great people. I like Kyle very much. He's a genuine man. He's very passionate. He made Hellstorm, which is a great documentary. If if any of you have not seen it yet, please watch it. It's called Hellstorm. And you will cry if you watch it. Definitely. Yeah, you, you got to go to Hellstorm, the documentary. I think now. I don't think you may have find some mirrored copies on YouTube, but it's been banned from YouTube along with Dennis Wise's uh, "The Greatest Story Never Told." They right, both right. been guests here. They're they're excellent men, and, and so is Michael Thomas Goodrich, the man who wrote Hellstorm. Yep, yep, yeah. And then that, then all those videos, especially "The Greatest Story Never Told." which I started looking into in 2012 as Dennis Wise was making them in, in chapters. So it wasn't finished yet. So I'd wait every two weeks. He'd make a new chapter. And I was waiting there, learning, learning, and I was reading books and I was reading Dr. Duke's books and I read everything. So in, in year 2012 is when I finally learned that the, that what was really going on, the white genocide, the truth about everything else. And I spent the last three years literally stuffing my head with information nonstop from documentaries to books. I'm still reading books to this day, still reading doc, uh, still watching documentaries. I just started watching Dennis Wise, uh, communism from the back door. Yeah. The new it's world not, order one. Yeah. It's a great it, series. 
it's not finished yet, but again, here I am waiting every time he puts one up. So I'm always trying to update myself. And uh, ever since I got into this cause or whatever, you know, people have been reaching out to me to get on radio shows. I've been doing that. But the most important thing I've been doing was running this organization, the National Youth Front, which in the last seven months or so, since our inception in February, we've done a lot of stuff. Okay, well, let's talk about National Youth Front for a minute. And yeah. what is it? Who can join? Okay. What kind of membership requirements are there? And what do y'all do? Okay, so basically the National Youth Front began as an elite youth organization for the preservation of our uh, people across the uh, our preservation of our people, culture, and nations across the globe. That's pretty much what it started as. And at first, we had a age limit, you know, as National Youth Front, right? We only want young kids, da 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 da. But over time, we just said, you know, because we had older guys say, hey, how can I help you? Even though I'm not young, I said, you know what? Let's get rid of this whole age limit. So now there's no age limit because we could always use the wisdom of older people in this movement who know a lot, who have made mistakes, who could tell us, don't do what I did. Here's a way to avoid that. Here's a better way to do this, right? Yeah, learn from somebody else's mistakes. Exactly. Or not even, or just have wisdom on your side. There's no reason to not have wisdom on your side. Uh, I said, okay, let's, let's get rid of the age group. And the National Youth Front, we have a boardroom. So it's not, I'm at the top as a chairman, but we have a boardroom where we all talk and we vote. So I make the final vote, but then there's times where I will actually go with the vote that's smaller, which makes more sense. You know, we, it's a democracy, but, you know, people usually trust what I say because we believe in that, you know, leadership principle. But I always ask my men of their opinions and we try to do what's best for the whole group. And the board really decides together. So if I'm outvoted, I'm outvoted. And that's fine with me, you know, because I don't want to just make a decision that nobody agrees with. You know, this isn't tyranny. Yeah. So. We have a group, we have a board and the board decided let's get rid of the age group and also let's go international, which we have. And we have people in the Ukraine. We have people in uh, other countries like the UK. Uh, Australia has a, has a good chapter there. They're do- they've already done activism as well. And the thing about the National Youth Front is that even though we have no age limit, most of our people, almost 99 percent of them are young, uh, ranging from, you know, 18 to whatever. And um uh, They've thought, most of them have done activism. I per, I've personally done activism myself as the chairman, which is which is motivating to these people because then it's not just some guy behind a computer telling you what to do. So uh, I've so done what, some so activism. What's, so what's the goal of um, National Youth Front? What well, are you trying to achieve? Well, we believe that the enemy is trying to brainwash our children and our youth. So the best thing to do is you fight don't them. Say. <laughs> it's to fight. It's to fight the battle at the campuses where this all began. Because the communists started doing this at the campuses. They came in the 60s and started pushing their filth in the campuses and the academia, and they took over. Yeah, what's what's hilarious to me about that, Angelo, is that the people that were uh, pushing free speech in the 60s are the same ones pushing hate language and hate crimes now. Right. So the battlefield is is at the campus. That's where it is, because the hearts and minds of our youth— they're still rebellious. You know, you tell them don't smoke cigarettes, they'll smoke cigarettes, you see? So you tell them to conform to hate speech, they'll be like, go screw yourself. So there's a chance to capture the youth and, and show them, look, you've our country has been usurped by these foreign people who want to destroy us, and uh, we need to do something about it. So we've done some successful campaigns that to prove our point. Okay, um, so so hold on. Slow down for just a second. Hold on. i got to let everybody know that we're um, you're listening to Sacred Cow Barbecue on Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. i got to tell you that, hey, this is our last week here. Um, on Tuesdays, we're moving over to Studio A on Thursdays. Uh, we'll be there at 10 p.m. on Thursdays from now on in Studio A, and we hope you'll join us there. I guess the most logical question you'd ask now is, what have we done? And most people want to know. Oh, well, first, before, basically... before you go to what you've done, how do you get onto these campuses? How did well, this because... start? Well, I mean, the thing is, the the whole point is that we, first of all, campuses are pretty much public property, most of them. I actually got banned from Boston University personally. B, <laughs> so B, I got, B, BU in, in, in Massachusetts, yeah, yeah. they call that BJU. Yeah, BJU. So they definitely banned me for protesting where, you know, I all I did was call out the racist Saida Grundy, who pretty much said all white males are a problem population. All we did was go on her, on her first day at work, and we posted flyers all over the place, which you know, said BU is anti-white. Yeah. That's all we did. And then they banned me. So they proved cl- that. Cl- that cl- clearly, truth. clearly anti-white. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but our first main mission was Arizona State University, 
which was a long time ago. This got us a lot of press uh, against the uh, problem with whiteness class. So here's a class that's called the problem of whiteness. Now, there's no other classes called the problem of blackness. There's no other classes called the problem of Jewishness. None of these things would even get to the drawing board. But here's a class called the problem of whiteness. It was uh, promoted by uh, this guy named Lee Bubout. He taught the class. And then this guy, Professor, uh, not Professor, but Robert Poe, was uh, videotaped on campus calling for violence against anyone that he considers is a racist. Now, the term racist is loosely used today. It can mean anything. And anyone who mobilizes, you could use violence against. So he's basically saying white people who want to stand up for their interests should be attacked uh, or beat up or, you know, we should stand up against. And that's what he's saying. Anti-whiteness. Anti-racist is a code word for anti-white. Right, because there's no anti-racist in Africa or in China. So they only exist in white countries. And here's this guy saying, yeah, well, you can mobilize against I believe in violence, if necessary, against people who mobilize. So basically, people who protest uh, against anti-white discrimination should be beat up, I guess. I don't know what he's trying to say. So he got in trouble for that at some level, and he protested his own school for getting in trouble at some level. We don't know what exactly happened. So then we counter-protested his protest against his own people. <laughs> and that was funny. We got him on tape, you know, trying to act like a tough guy, this and that. And uh, whatever the case, I don't know what happened to him ever since. I don't think he actually got fired, but he did get disciplined at some level. They removed him from the roster. But then the president of B, uh, of Arizona University, weeks later, comes out and says, we support everything, blah, 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 blah. So again, people say we lose every time we make these uh, stands, but we don't because we we said you're anti-white and then you show us you're anti-white. That's what these people don't understand. The so problem like, uh, with whiteness, they actually yeah. have a class that they... Now, a friend of mine took some classes from ASU and they were ridiculous. I have never seen yeah. more ridiculous curriculum. The thing that I brought up a very good point in one of my... When I got interviewed, I said, well, it's illegal for public schools to have such classes. It's illegal. You cannot have classes that promote... Uh, any form of hatred or degrade or blame a race or any ethnicity for something, point out or unify them against or say they're wrong in any way. So there, you can't have race-based classes or ethnic-based classes promoting them or not promoting them. It's illegal in public schools and charter schools in Arizona. Yet here in colleges at a place supposedly of higher learning, you're allowed to be racist against people? So they're saying the problem of whiteness, their excuse is, well, the label of whiteness, it's it's the, the concept of whiteness. They're saying that the identity of being called white is a problem, you know, so they're saying, but that's really not, it all comes back to it's all white people's fault is what they're trying to say. Well, everything is, and it's not just right, right. white white people, it's more white men. Right. You're, so, the, you're the demons, yeah. you're the blue-eyed devils. Right. So Arizona State University got us a lot of press, USA Today, all these other crap, a bunch of reporters uh, libeling us with nonsense, you know, this and that. And then uh, we did another school, this this, uh, this school called Camino Real in sure. California oh, passed sure. out. It passed out these flyers, you know, that p- white people need a white space where they can unlearn racism because people of color don't want to deal with their energy with all this racism. And I, and this is a public school, so this absolutely violated state law, 100%, and federal law, the Civil Rights Act. And not one peep came out of that school or any media outlet. We emailed ABC, NBC, all the people in that state, nothing came of it whatsoever. Uh, we even filed paperwork to investigate. No clue what happened to that. So it's clear that they don't care. And then... So this is this that's no, their they, second they, attempt. No, no, they just want to continue the assault against whites, yeah. and yeah. the media is going to shut up about it because the same people that that manage the media manage everything else. Right. So then later we did another. We ran into another, and there's so many anti-whites. We could. There was one guy in Washington teaching anti-white stuff in a chemistry class. We couldn't get to him because he was in like Washington State. I don't know, and we didn't have any members up there. But anyway, so the next mission that we had was Appalachian State University, another ASU, which had a privilege board, male privilege, cisgender privilege, all these weird privileges, these Marxists just make up. So we went over there and we put up our version of a privilege board uh, exposing their nonsense. 
and this school went ballistic. They're like, Nazis are on campus. They called the police, all this stuff. I mean, our guys came in and out. We do everything stealth mode. We never tell you how many people we have, when we're coming. We come in, we come out, and that's it. They okay, were all so wait a minute. So what did, they, what did they mean by all these privileges? What was this privilege well, like about? Male, pri- male privilege, Christian privilege, cisgender privilege, uh, straight privilege, all that stuff. So, oh, so when oh, they so put anything they want to undermine in our culture. Right, right. And and the board was made by some like this, I don't know, homosexual Asian blend per I don't know what race he was, couldn't tell. But he was you know, so so next to male privilege we put a picture of graveyard of all the dead soldiers. Yes, I, said, no, I love I love that yeah. meme. That's one of my yep. favorite yeah. memes. So we, we made these memes up like Christian privilege and I showed people get eaten by lions and crucified. Uh, so we made fun of their privilege board. And then we also we did this uh, together with Trad Youth Network, which is another organization uh, run by Matthew Heinbach and Matt Parrott. And they do a different approach. They do a religious approach, but still on the same page. And, you know, we all we did was put up flyers uh, other than those memes. Ours said, defend your people. That's it. And then there said faith, family and folk. And the reporters put defend your people, a small but chilling phrase. Like, are you serious? How scary? You can't even defend yourself as a white person, and it's it's evil. So it just shows you how crazy the school is. And it's Appalachian State, where it's most poor white people in this country. So where's the white privilege for all these poor white people in Appalachian? <laughs> yeah, I like I think you've got a good no white sense. privilege. Don't you have a meme about that? You show some poor white children out in a farm yeah, somewhere? Picking, picking cotton. Yeah. Yeah, they were picking cotton. You know, so I got all types of memes. If you go to our website, I, I've, I've made all of them myself personally. So this is from my mind. And um, yeah, I put them out there and I use them on the Internet a lot. I use them when I'm on Twitter because I don't even get in conversations anymore. I just I, I see an anti-white. I post pictures and I let the audience see how stupid they are and I get moving. Yeah, but well, I've, you know, Angela, one of the ones that I really liked was and I in fact, I think I put it on on FedBook yesterday was the one where you had a world wrestling federation you yeah. know the fa- fake wrestling <laughs> and then you yeah. showed congress i mean it was great so tell, yeah, tell just, people about that one I, it was one of my favorites well that was like the first one i ever made one of the first ones i ever made as you progress uh, at the memes page you'll see how like i use the symbol i make the symbol different uh, as i go now i have a round stamp you know what i mean because i learned how to use photoshop a lot better the one you're referring to is uh it shows two pictures it shows wwf SummerSlam, world rumble and it says, still more believable than, and then a picture of Congress. <laughs> you know? I loved it. I mean, I got all types of ones. Like, you know, I got one of them says, uh, it says treason. It used to get you here. And it shows you the gallows. And then it said, then it shows a picture of Congress. So, yeah. you know, I do all sorts of ones. Those are just like, like general um, truths. But then I get into ones about white genocide. They're all there. Just go there and look at them. And they get better as you scroll down. The ones at the top are the oldest ones I've made. The newest ones are at the bottom. So you'll, you'll see how I get better at using Photoshop and things become more clear and crisp and, and just better looking to look cool. at. So so people can go over there and use your memes and, and, and put yes, them out, yes, right? Yeah, they're there for the taking. I absolutely want you to do that because that spreads our website and it also makes points that I believe are irrefutable. I mean, they, you know, I make some really good memes that you just can't refute them. You know, it's just... Uh, they just make sense. And, and a meme is a great way to make a point and just disappear without a fight. Yeah, a, a, you don't a, need picture's, fight. a picture's oh. worth a thousand right. words, you know? Like, like, like I, put the, I put the problem of whiteness meme, right? And I, and I show, you know, I show, like, a, a philosopher, people making vaccines, an airplane, cities, computer technology, the moon, the Constitution, and a car. Like, the problem of whiteness, right? You know, it's like, it's just like, there's, you can't argue that because we've done all those things. Well, we're anti-vaccine here, so you're going to have to change that one. But that's okay. Well, it's not, it's not even a vaccine. I mean, who, I mean, people say it's a vaccine, but she's just doing – I don't know what she's this woman's making. She's doing some kind of science, yeah, some kind of laboratory. That's, that's, work that's, 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 that's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, I've been criticized. Well, it's vaccines. I'm like, well, how do you know what's in there? Here's one I put with the Velociraptor. You know, you ever see that meme with the, with the little Velociraptor that thinks? So I put, if race doesn't exist, then why do we have racial quotas? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. The, the Jews are, are, are the first to argue that race does. There's no such thing as race, but yeah. they're the first ones to argue why they need to preserve their culture and their race. And that's yeah. why they can't take any immigrants in, in Israel. Yeah. And then I say one, I have one that's really important. I'll, I'll use stats like 
white female privilege. And I say this graph from the Department of Defense, the Department of Justice shows that white women have the privilege of being raped by black men 3, 37,461 times per year. That's 33.6%, while the number of black women who are raped by white men is represented by zero because the occurrence of white on black rape is not even 1% per year. So that just shows you you know, how crazy it is in reverse. And I, and I have all sorts of memes, again, some to make fun of the enemy, some to make facts, point out statistics. But they're all there for your, for your taking. Please use them because when you use them, you spread our logo, you spread our ideas, you spread our website. And uh, that's exactly what I want you to do. And that's why I made them, because it's very important that uh, these memes are not only recruiting tools, but also used to get points across and destroy the, the narrative of the enemy. So okay. I, I love the one of the Rubik's Cube. Yeah. Multiculturalism versus nationalism. I mean, you decide. I think it's I think that was how do you think of that one? Well, actually, I actually saw that made by someone else that was actually wasn't as good graphic. So I took that and I made a better graphic one and I put you decide which one you want. So, I mean, not all of these are originally from me personally, but, you know, I, if I see something I like, I'll make it better. Yeah, that's, that's how I do it. You take it, make it better. But so I want to know, you've got this interesting logo here. It's like yes. almost a triangle with two triangles and Explain to me what does that mean? Well, that that's I made that myself. That's I that's my invention. Uh, that's my intellectual property. I call it the all mega. So basically, what it is is the alpha symbol, which is an A, right, and the omega symbol, which is the last letter of the Greek letter of uh, the Greek alphabet. Which just I love the way it looks. The uh, the omega. Sure. You know, as a young kid, I used to look at Omega watches. Sure. Uh, and just be like, oh, I love that symbol. Well, it turns out the Alpha and Omega is also a kind of not a religious thing, but like it's the beginning of the end. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's the beginning it's, and the end. That's that's how Christ is portrayed right. as being the Alpha and, and Omega. Right? And it's also, in my view, the beginning and the end of all things. And also, the way I look at it is, it's it incorporates all of nature. So I, I created the Omega to represent all things and the, the natural order of all things. And it's in this triangular form because there is a hierarchy of this natural order. OK, it's not no one. Not everybody's equal. And, and, and it's also and it's a red color because it's blood bloodlines. OK, so it's preserve your people. There's a hierarchy. It's a natural order to preserve yourselves. And it includes everything. It, inclu it includes good and evil. So it's not like this symbol represents total peace. It doesn't mean total war. It means the natural order includes all things good and bad. And there's a hierarchy to this order. And within it, you have to preserve yourself. And that's the struggle that we all face. So that's really what that means. It's a very crisp, beautiful design. I, I, yes. I wanted to know what it meant. I like it. I like the red on the black better than I like the red on the white. But I do like the the meme on your heritage. I think that's excellent. Yes, that's that's the whole point, because what happens is our our children, our youth are taught to hate their heritage, to be ashamed, white guilt, white privilege. So mm -hmm. that's why it's imperative that we take the battle to the campuses where this is this is really what's happening there, you know, and I mean, they start this crap in kindergarten. They're telling you there's no oh. such as white people. And again, you know, the best thing to do is get to people in their teens uh, who are already beginning to rebel against the system, who are more open minded, who have the access to loose change and all these other videos and seeing all these movies because they're the ones on the Internet surfing, you know. Right. And uh, yeah. but again, we've been we've we've hit resistance with the colleges because they're so brainwashed to, to hate themselves mostly. But uh, we've had a lot of people send us messages after our activism saying thank you very much, you know. I hate this school. I want to leave. I've had people join. Every time we do activism, people join and they donate. So another thing about our group, every time we do activism, we record it. We make a video. We put music. We make cool effects. So we, we're, we're kind of we're kind of we have a we have a good guy who makes videos. He's very talented. He actually makes videos for a lot of different people. So he's trying to build his own little brand. And uh, he does wonderful videos for us. And that motivates the youth. Look how cool these guys are. They're up, you know, they're they're hip. You know, they got the cool music. They got the good effects. It's not just some boring group on the Internet. Uh, so we got these funny memes that most of the youth will understand because I take the guy from like Dos Equis and I put oh, him yeah. on there. You know? I mean, I use, <laughs> I use things people can relate to. Some, some older generation will understand. But again, our target's the youth. And then we make these cool videos. I, I like your I like your anti-feminism one. 
That's really yeah. great. Those girls holding up this, those signs and things like that. So, okay. So this, this seems to, uh, something that appeals, appears, excuse me, appeals to males. It uh, does it appeal to young women as well. Well, we have women in our ranks. They're not many, but we have women in our organization. In fact, one joined a few days ago. It's just that there's not many women that are nationalists, really, the way I look at it. I mean, I've been in this organization, or I've been looking at this movement for a while, and just women don't really gravitate to it much, which I think is because they are more programmed to follow the alpha male, and the society is telling you the alpha male is the black man and the rapper. So a uh, white man has been demonized, castrated. Most white men have feminized, feminized. And so women, they're not really designed to go to battle. So those of you nationalist women who are here listening are the bravest of all the women on this planet. I tend to think that we're high testosterone women. Lana Lockheft was on from Red yeah. Ice Creations last week and what she's doing. She's an incredible businesswoman. She's uh, outspoken. She's intelligent. I mean, she's on it. And, and so for there aren't a lot of us, but I think as the more creative part of this starts going, I think it'll attract more women. And I'm proud of you because, you know, women are looking for strong males. And yes. so when they, when they find one, it resonates with them and they know that's what's missing in our culture these days. You know, we're going to be coming up on here on a break uh, pretty quick, Angelo. So when the music starts and everything, we'll just hold that thought and, and go on to the next thing. But I'm, re I'm really interested that you don't see a lot of women in, in this movement. And that's one thing I said, where are all the women? You know, where are all the people that think like me? So well, they're welcome to join our group. And we have girls in our in our organization. In fact, the last we did, the last thing we did was at Rutgers University. And there's a there's a young woman in the video with us doing this flyering. Uh, you can obviously see her there. And uh, the Rutgers one was the last. Uh, the last thing before Rutgers was the Seda Grundy to get, you know, she made fun of, uh, she said the white males are a problem population, which got me banned, which is hilarious. I love that, where it is a badge of honor. But our last activism was against Rutgers University, which this queer feminist, he's a man, queer feminist, um, his name is uh, Kevin Allred, said that there's no good white people, only uh, bad white people. We could only be, sh see it, it, be seen in shades of less bad. And so like, and he's laughing like, hey, Angelo, I, I saw your handiwork, but I still have a job. Uh, I guess you didn't work. I said, hey, dude, you proved this wrong. Right. We, hey, we, just had, we just had two hours of information yeah. and an hour from Angelo John Gage. Stay with us. There's more coming. <laughs> 